Hi there, new camera angle today. So you asked me about Boeing's for Bach's sixth suite prelude, and as usual with the Bach suites, there are a lot of options and not a lot of clarity about what one should do or what he really intended. So in um, Ana Magdalena's manuscript, what it looks like is, and then this, this one, nothing. So um, it looks like most of the time the in this figure, it's, and that makes sense to me because then you have the last note of each group on an up bow, and so you can use that to make a, a separate voice of its own. Um, and then when it comes to this, this, um, it seems to me that the slur gets a little bit longer, like maybe this is three in under bow. Here, there's no slur in Ana Magdalena. So, um, I still, I tend to play all three in a bow here. Uh, although I also sometimes vary that with... And um, that's also, it's partly to vary the phrasing and it's partly to maybe bring out a different voice sometimes. Um, so I'm just giving you options and then you'll have to make your own informed decision. And the more you look at uh, other people's decisions, the easier it will be for you to find your own and, and do try out your own constantly. Um, okay, so my solution is for this figure, this... And Then, um, you didn't ask about this, but I see in your video that this section... Um, that you may be struggling with the fingering there. And the fingering, this is where the fingering is most tricky, I think, for um, the four-string cello. The five-string cello, you've got an extra string and it must be really great. I've never played it myself on five string cello. Um, but what I try to do is to imitate the sound of the, the fifth string by keeping the third finger on the D string all the time for the E. And then I just move the thumb all the time. So. for you and if you like it. What I like about it is that I can make the, the voice on the A string much more distinct. There's and then there's not so much distraction of shifting. So that's some of the technical stuff. And then right in the beginning, I would recommend to you that as you're starting this piece, as with any box suite, as with any movement of a box suite, um, that you find the lay of the land as you're going along. And um, I'm a big fan of trying to get the, the harmonic relationships really clear right from the beginning uh, so that um, you don't practice in a kind of tabula rasa way where you could then paint anything onto it, but 
you start to feel um, a particular way about each harmony. So I'll just go through this, what it's like for me. Unfortunately, we're not having a conversation about this right now, but we will soon. So, um, this obviously is our home base. And then in the next, um, and this is, this I see as the slightly freer version of the D major home base. So this is like, to me, dance. This. And then this is like the explanation, the, the singing part. Echoes are completely up to you. It seems to make sense to me right now to do it. Maybe next week, not. And then we arrive at A major. To me, even more jubilant, a fifth up. Um, in any case, a higher register and therefore more brilliant. Um, and again, same structure. I already try to keep in mind, practicing this, that the structure is parallel and that I don't have to paint a lot of detail onto these things. Or even this motive. I find that in a structure like this, it's really important to feel an entire structure, an entire segment, not to feel the individual notes like that can be a part of your practice. In fact, I think it's an important part of your practice, feeling the the subjective distance between each note and how the how the melody notes co combine to make the harmony. You can certainly take your time and really meditate on how that feels within the figure. And then go and practice the whole figure and, and try to unify it so that this, now you have this unit. And you can take that unit and compare it to another unit, um, which will be... Because now we can't do this. We can't do the same figure in that, in that um, register. I hope that makes sense. So to take the D major um, version, this would be... sequence, not sequence, this whole segment as one unit, and then I'm able to feel that unit here, and I can feel the next unit here. There's lots of squeaks, sorry, I need new bow hair, but I can't get it. Um, and so that's a way of keeping your, keeping your, your harmonies on different planes and understanding them that way right from the beginning. Then, another thing about, um, about harmony, um, you've got this whole A major, very jubilant First diminished chord so far. So then we're moving up. So to me, this just naturally feels different and should sound different from... Right? So for me, this is more hesitant. Not necessarily in time, but in the feeling. And then we lead to, it leads to E minor. So. And then you have this long stretch of E minor where you have to figure out your fingerings and your, your aesthetic. Um, and then you come out of the E minor into this 
again diminished sequence. No sequence, but section. And this whole section is is lacking in any conclusive cadence for a long time. to rest in F sharp, but no, it goes on E minor. So one interesting thing that I like to do here, actually in all the box suites, I like to look for pedal points that might be there if he had written a bass note, a bass line. So here, what I see, what I hear, as a potential bass line, a potential pedal point, is um, starting from um, when it comes on, starting from here, what if there were an F sharp? Okay, I can't sing either line, so just imagine an F sharp continuing. So, um, if you think of this whole period from until that whole stretch as a long, uh, a long extension of, of tension of this F sharp pedal point, then it is, uh, it gives it that much more, um, Gives it that much more tension, structure, form, and then you have a real release when you get to. And now we have a new form of kind of call and answer. Also, an interesting setup here that we have on the first and second beat here. Now we have the answer on third and fourth beat. First and second beat. Third and fourth. And then interruption on the second beat. And then only here, finally, if you imagine that we had this long F sharp pedal point before, finally now we have the resolution here in B minor. And of course it doesn't hold for long. Um, going to A major and then A dominant seventh and so on. And then and so and this is how we work our way to G major. Um, so B minor is a major arrival. Uh, yeah, B minor, sorry, did I say B major? B minor is a major <laughs> arrival point um, after this long stretch of what I consider to be the F sharp um, desert. And uh, and then and it's it's a turning point in my opinion that this is where B minor turns to A major A dominant seventh D major and then D dominant seventh and G so it's good to be able to identify these stretches so you know where are you going to play through a little bit more so you can uh, because as you play you're you're directing the audience's ear uh, and this is what we were working on also in the C major suite directing the ear. And that means sometimes taking a stretch and maybe playing through it more fluidly and then taking other stretches uh, or certain passages, certain chords that are really important for everything that happens afterwards 
and emphasizing them. So make a little map of your prelude up until this point, and I think that can really help you. Then another thing um, specific to your video just now is decisions about fingerings. Now, um, because we're working with a very different instrument, a very different bow than what Bach had in his time and, and the instrument that this was written for, which is apparently not all that clear which instrument he wrote it for. Um, but in any case, we're dealing with a very different instrument. It has different, um, different distances. It has uh, obviously very different resonance. So we have to develop our own aesthetic. And in developing my aesthetic, I have decided that fingerings and bowings have to be complementary. So that means that um, if I want to do a fingering like this, then I will, if I decide that that's, ex that's absolutely the fingering that I have to have, then I will make the bowing accommodate that fingering so that I don't hear a but make it so sometimes when it seems to me really clear that Anna Magdalena meant this is the bowing um, and in this case I think to me it looks like like that's the bowing actually so in a case where I think that the bowing is in stone, at least for me, uh, then I'll try to make the fingering accommodate the bowing so that I never have anything like um, something like that kind of a shift being audible under one slur. So that's another thing to take into consideration when you think about your bowings. Make sure that your, your fingerings are also complementary or that you don't mind the shift that is then audible because of the combination of bowing and fingering that you're using. Okay, then just one more comment about your video. I see that you're, you're using not very much bow and uh, it looks like your right shoulder is starting to get a little tense, especially when the left hand is higher up here and the left shoulder is lifting just a little bit. So when the left shoulder lifts, then usually the right shoulder goes with it. So I would encourage you to keep this slow for now, go back to a slightly slower tempo and feel freer in your bow arm. So you can do something like if you're going to use this bow, like and move your head around while you're doing that, maybe even talk as we've been talking about in the Klassenstunde. Just takes to get everything here relaxed, to get your shoulders relaxed, and to get your arm moving a little bit more so that you can use the natural resonance of the cello when you want a more brilliant sound and you don't have to push. Okay, then you can also experiment. If you do want more resonance as you go up, when I practice this, I try to use almost the entire bow. Just I know that I'm not going to use that much when I perform, but I want to feel that free. So if I play it, if I practice this in a slow tempo, then I know that when it's faster, I'll be able to use at least half the bow. And then what I also practice for the upbow specifically is this little lift with the first finger so that I'm only on the string for the very beginning of the up bow and in the air for the rest of it, so you don't get a, a too loud up bow. Okay, that's all for now. I hope this helps.